morning, good afternoon. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, good getting ready for bed for those who are very close to bedtime. But thanks everybody for joining this event today. I see we already have seven, seven participants, our number still growing, and we have uh, colleagues connected from all parts of the world. It's really nice and exciting to see you um, to discuss this important uh, topic uh, in, the, in this webinar today. The question for you and I today, for every one of us is, who benefits from public spending? And um, I want you all to start thinking about that. Start uh, giving us your thoughts on the chat while we also discuss with uh, all the people that are here to uh, speak with us today. A second question I would like to pose is, what is the place of gender in public financial management? So again, you're welcome to this very important uh, event. Um, the event has been put together by many parts of the World Bank, um, organized by the World Bank uh, uh, Governance Global, pra uh, Governance, um, Global Practice, um, under the leadership of, of course, the event is led by the PIFA Secretariat and also the, glo the Gender Global Practice um, under the Accelerate Equality year-long event that has been taking place. I hope you've been able to participate in some of these events. Um, just some housekeeping. Um, I'll suggest that as this very important conversation goes on, you put your questions, your comments on the chat. We'll try and address as many questions as possible in the course of the event. Um, I'll also appreciate that uh, when you are not speaking, please keep your mic mute so that we can have very good uh, quality and hear the speaker very well. I'll appreciate if the panelists can keep their camera on all through the event, if bandwidth permits on your side. Um, just uh, to let you know, this event is recorded um, so that um, we let you know your uh, privacy is not invaded. It's a recorded event, uh, but, um, this will be shared and you can have the opportunity to see the event. So to kickstart uh, this event today, I have um, two of our senior um, management team leading this work uh, this morning. Um, Anna Brixey, who is a, a global uh, director for gender and Aturo Herrera, the global director for the governance global practice. So let me start my conversation with you, Hannah. And uh, you know, I have my question, very simple. Why and how does public finance, financial management accelerate equality? Over to you, Hannah. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Nika. And, and uh, I'm really delighted to, to, to share the stage with Arturo. Welcome back, Arturo. And, uh, and with colleagues uh, uh, from governance, from MTI, from gender, but importantly also with practitioners uh, to, to share uh, perspectives because the, the, the questions you pose, pose is, is, uh, is very important. Uh, uh, let me perhaps start with a little bit of context. So uh, you know, this year marks the 10th anniversary of the World Development Report on Gender Equality and Development. Uh, and uh, you know, as you mentioned, Nika, the World Bank Group has launched a year-long Accelerate Equality Initiative to explore progress made, draw lessons learned, you know, showcase successes over the past 10 years uh, in closing gender gaps and promoting women's empowerment, and drive for transformative change in the future. Now, over the past 10 years, some progress has been made, especially in areas uh, uh, related to gender equality in, in, with respect to human capital, you know, such as uh, reducing maternal mortality, uh, improving girls' education. And this progress has been made partly thanks to appropriate prioritization of public expenditures to these, uh, uh, in, in these areas. But many gender inequalities still persist, including very low female labor force participation, uh, sharp occupational uh, segregation, which drives a lot of the existing pay gap between women, women and men, 
uh, gender inequalities exist in asset ownership and control of assets from land to mobile phones and in voice and agency, including uh, uh, gender-based violence, uh, uh, women's participation in decision-making, which remains relatively low. Now, furthermore, as the latest Women, Business and Law report shows, uh, there is also, uh, also in countries where there is strong legal framework and, and, and expenditures allocated to important areas with respect to gender equality, implementation and enforcement are often weak. Now, the long-standing challenges have been exacerbated by, by the pandemic and, and threatened to be made worse by the impacts of climate change, fragility, forced displacement, food insecurity, and, and other crises. So, for example, women's economic empowerment, jobs, entrepreneurship, and women-led businesses have all suffered disproportionately in many countries um, or due to the, due the crises. And uh, we also have observed over the past few years that the burden of care and domestic work, uh, as well as the risks of gender-based violence have increased. Now, on the positive side, uh, the World Bank Group, in collaboration with development partners and countries, have generated a lot of new data, gender data, and also evidence on what works in, in, uh, in closing gender gaps and empowering women and girls. So evidence is showing what, what, what works. So for example, when I look to public finance as a powerful instrument for accelerating gender equality and women's empowerment, we see that some expenditures can be truly transformative. So, so expenditures on sexual and reproductive health, on gender-based violence prevention, on childcare uh, support uh, or on paid parental leave can all help advance gender equality in many dimensions, including uh, human capital and jobs. And uh, expenditures toward gender equality can also be cost effective, you know, in the context of tight fiscal space, cost effective to not only to promote gender equality and women's empowerment, but also for the, for the instrumental value with respect to other development outcomes, such as human capital or jobs or solving uh, uh, the food security for the future. So we see, for example, that expenditures toward women's and girls' empowerment can improve resilience in communities uh, and in households, uh, can help with sustainable delivery, especially when we think about the skills for the kinds of jobs that will be uh, uh, generated through the green transitions, uh, expenditures and uh, addressing the specific constraints that women face, and, and including women's farmer. Let's you know, uh, remember that 50% of farmers, for example, in Africa are women. So addressing the constraints they are facing can also help with food and nutrition security, and of course, it also helps with uh, improving decision-making in communities when women are empowered. Now, to, to promote gender equality and women's empowerment, many countries have adopted some form of gender-responsive budgeting. Uh, and the term, as here we all know, refers to many things in terms of fiscal policy on, on the revenue, as well as expenditure policies, as well as public finance management. And not all approaches are equally effective or, or appropriate in, in every country context. So uh, overall, we see the aim in many countries has been to better align uh, government choices about how to raise and allocate resources with the objectives of gender equality. We also see, and I look forward to the conversation today and to the experiences on how gender budgeting uh, and, and integrating gender equality in, in fiscal policy can help uh, 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 in, in promoting specific, uh, 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 specific objectives, uh, uh, you know, including uh, not only uh, designing and developing policies toward these objectives, but also improving the implementation and the monitoring uh, uh, and, and accountability and evaluation uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of these policies. Now, uh, by 2002, we've seen that about 40 countries uh, have engaged in some form of gender budgeting. 
uh, currently it is over 80 countries and uh, and I think it is important to draw lessons what which approaches have worked and and how and I think uh, this this discussion today will be very helpful uh, in that respect uh, in addition what would be also helpful is to uh, assess what are the remaining gender inequalities that are built into the public finance so, so it's not only the question of how public finance can help but it's also a question of uh, understanding analyzing and addressing the inequalities that are currently built on into the uh, public finance uh, when it comes to uh, you know gender specific tax allowances when it comes to income tax uh, and when it comes to even uh, VAT and, and other taxes as well as on the expenditures, such as, uh, for example, health expenditures. Now, we see that uh, uh, in, in countries with high administrative capacity, there are many opportunities to, to improve gender equality through, uh, through uh, tax and expenditure policies and through further improving public finance management systems. I think uh, one question for discussion is, uh, what really are the effective approaches in countries with low administrative capacity and with relatively uh, 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 also limited uh, uh, availability of, of gender data. Now, let me, let me conclude perhaps uh, just to give a few examples uh, which uh, from the gender perspective is, uh, uh, is uh, emerging as a, uh, as a as a promising approach also in what the World Bank has been doing in this area. Uh, now the World Bank Group has established a, a partnership working on revenue mobilization with institutions such as IMF and the OECD and the UN. Uh, there is also a strong partnership through IDA. So for example, now IDA 20, the new uh, uh, set of policy commitments includes a new policy commitment to uh, close gender gaps through fiscal policy and through budget systems. And importantly, we already have examples of on what works uh, in, in, in bank operations. So to give you a few examples, uh, in Mozambique, the, the managing public resources for service delivery seems to be uh, seems to have a very innovative approach to improve domestic tax management, budget execution and transparency and accountability uh, uh, with respect also to uh, gender equality uh, objectives. In Morocco, the public sector performance program will support the alignment of gender responsive budgeting and the performance approach in public spending uh, uh, by fostering the inclusion and achievement of gender related indicators in performance plans or in Uzbekistan, uh, the sustaining market reforms programs aims to encourage firm growth and formal job creation, especially uh, for women uh, and, and the borrowers adopted uh, already uh, a, a kind of gender sensitive definition of small businesses for tax and value added tax registration purposes. So there are already some good examples and it's of, of course important to learn from from the examples that exist uh, in countries and replicate uh, what has worked and explore uh, effective uh, exa uh, effective approaches on the way forward. So let me perhaps stop here and uh, and uh, pass the floor back to Adenika and uh, let me just kind of reiterate how important this discussion is and uh, and for us uh, jointly then to think in terms of implementation of, of IDA 20 policy commitments and more broadly supporting countries in using the the, the, the using fiscal policy and public finance management advances to further promote gender equality as an objective and also for its instrumental value for other development outcomes. So thank you and back to you. Thanks very much, Hannah, and uh, specifically thanks for your leadership on this subject. You know, um, a few things jumps at me in, in the many things you've said. One is the fact that everybody connected and uh, we have 120 participants now. We need to make a conscious effort to advance gender equality. So, I mean, just doesn't come like that. It has to be a conscious effort. We need to monitor the government and all stakeholders need to monitor this effectively. I mean, amongst uh, so many very good things that you said. Thanks so much for that, Hannah. So I'd like to go to Aturu for um, his opening remarks. Uh, Aturu, I'd like you to, I mean, focus on a question that, you know, worries me. I mean, 
I, I ponder over a lot and why focus on gender is important for good governance. And I know you, you're working very hard and you've been working on good governance. So why does gender, I mean, why is gender important in the work on good governance? That's to over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki, and thank you. And um, hi to everybody. Yeah, it's good to see so many uh, known faces. Anna, uh, Chiara, uh, hi to everybody. Um, I think what, one of the, of the most important issues in this particular juncture is to recognize that we are, as we are start to move little by little to a post-COVID world, there's some sort of international consensus in the, in the international co community that is not about going back to 2019, to, to, to before COVID started. It's about how, to, how do we build a better world? And in that particular aspect, how do we address some of the issues that were really recognized as really, really urgent long time ago, that for one reason or another had not been addressed. And the top of everybody's uh, list is, are there are two issues, climate change and gender equality. But one thing that we know very well in governance is that being a priority uh, is not sufficient to be an issue that is addressed successfully. One thing that is very close to our heart in governance is that we recognize that if something is a true priority, it needs to find, to find a place in the budget. Public policies are not, uh, are not executed in the, in the vacuum, they are executed uh, through the budget. Now, that's easier said than, than done. Uh, budget, we know, it tends to, it tends to move in, incre in incremental, in incremental changes. Uh, and, and in that sense, tend to have a very strong inertial uh, component. And that perhaps is one of the reasons why budget officers tend to be really reluctant to introduce new elements into the, in, 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 into the budget. So in order to make so successful uh, uh, new initiatives to address relevant issues like, like, like gender equality, we need to do several things. One is we need to put it in to put the, to write down the priorities in a way in which Bob, in which budget officials understand it, and then have little by little building fiscal space uh, to, to 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 introduce it. In that sense, I think uh, uh, some of the issues that we are going to discuss uh, this morning are very uh, are very important. One of them is the use. Of the of, of the PIFA instrument to identify progress and and if at all uh, gender responsive uh, policies are being introduced in the in, in the budget. PIFA has become the gold standard to measure public financial management across 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 country, and it has several several advantages when we when we use it in this way. The most important is the the PIFA gender. Annex, which is now 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 we introduce it to specifically tar, try to 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 uh, identify progress in gen, in 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 gender issues. But there are some other advantages. PIFA is a language that that budget officials understand across uh, 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 across the world. The second one is have a, it has a a a, a two way purpose. On the one hand, it helps to tag if there are already gender responsive measures in the, in, in the budget. On the second hand, it helps to monitor advance on whatever programs are oriented to, 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 to improve uh, gender equality conditions in, a, in any country. There are two more issues that I would like to touch lightly before, before, before closing my, my, my remarks. One was already mentioned by Hannah. Uh, the, the, the 20th replacement of Ida recognize uh, uh, gender gender response fiscal policies as very as very important. And in that sense, Ida countries are gonna have a, an additional advantage if they are able to introduce, attack, follow, and monitor this uh, uh, gender response uh, uh, equality. And, and the second comment that I want to do it has to do with the role of the of the of the PIFA secretariat. The PIFA secretariat is providing the technical support for countries 
who, who, use, who use PIFA, but it also in this particular context it will help with two or three very important things. Uh, the first one is data and, and analytics. It could also provide uh, training uh, uh, related uh, to these issues and to help to develop a new standard within the PFM and the gover and, and governance related to gender related uh, to gender equality issues from the perspective of budget. Uh, let me stop here, Nikki, and let me just uh, conclude by by saying how 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 grateful and uh, how lucky I am to be in this kind of meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Arturo. We are more grateful to have you in this kind of event. Uh, your perspectives uh, are, are really strong and important to this. I see something coming out from what Arturo said and which Anna also emphasized. It's um, being able to monitor the IDA 20 policy commitments related to gender. Because if we can really work on these in many of the countries, then my question is answered. We are able to accelerate uh, you know, gender equality if we can monitor this. So I guess this is one thing we should all keep in focus, both for, uh, for us as development partners, but for each of the countries. So let me just give a quick uh, run through what uh, we'll be going through today. Um, again, thanks for the introduction uh, and, uh, and the remarks, Anna and Aturu. Um, going forward, we'll go into a panel discussion. Then um, I'll call on the PIFA secretariat to give us some quick uh, presentation and statistics. After that, we'll hear from country representatives and get a reflection from a donor. So at this point, I would like to move on to the panel discussion. And um, to help us with this discussion today, I have two colleagues, um, one from the IMF and the other from the World Bank. Um, I have Vincent Tang. Um, Vincent is an economist in the Fiscal Affairs Department of the IMF. Vincent, thanks very much for joining me. And of course, I have Kiara Bronche. Um, practice manager in the fiscal policy and sustainable growth unit of the uh, world in the World Bank. Um, Kara, thanks so much for joining um, as well and sharing your perspectives. So, colleagues, I would like to pose uh, some questions to the two of you, and if you can help me to answer in about three minutes, um, and I'll start with Vincent. Um, I know very well that uh, IMF has done recent research on the progress on gender responsiveness of fiscal policies um, and uh, the um, gender respons responsiveness of public financial management in G20 countries. Um, the headline findings uh, seems to be that many countries have gender responsive fiscal policies, but there are still some significant challenges in the implementation. So could you tell us a bit more about these, about the findings and probably the way forward? Uh, if you can do this in three minutes, Vincent, thank you very much. About Absolutely. Um, first of all, I wanted to just very quickly commend PIFA for their excellent work on gender, particularly since the framework was launched in 2020. This is a really world leading framework. I hope that people are really paying attention to the type of um, interest and demand and, and the impact it's creating. So a really big commendment. Um, to, to the PIF Secretariat for that. Um, I also want to say that the IMF, why is the IMF talking about gender in the first place? Well, you know, the IMF really, uh, based on a lot of analysis and, and research and evidence, strongly believes that gender is macro critical. That is, it's not just that gender equality in and of itself is a good thing, but actually we also now know it's critical for the macroeconomic health of countries um, in terms of its you know, macro stability in terms of the public finances, in terms of the long run productivity growth of the country, um, and ensuring that that growth is inclusive. So um, who benefits from public spending? Your initial question, Nikkei, the answer is everyone in the country. This is not just a, a small part of uh, a problem. This is this is the problem. And we believe that gender budgeting is, um, you know, incredibly powerful tool for tackling uh, gender inequality um, and amplifies the effectiveness of fiscal policies. So to your question of you know, what do we learn from, the, from our assessment of gender budgeting practices in the G20, well, the first thing is that gender budgeting is an important and substantive movement across the G20. 
This is not a small movement, this is an important movement, and there's been really encouraging progress across nearly every country in the G20 over the past 15 years. Countries such as Canada, Austria, Mexico, France, South Korea have demonstrated strong levels of practice, uh, including through having really insightful institutional frameworks baked through their PFM systems, um, gender responsive budget classifications, uh, and ensuring that gender specific guidelines are included in their budget preparation. You know, this is not an afterthought, it's actually baked in to the budget preparation process. And these have made real differences. This is what we've learned. You know, these countries are telling us, um, look, uh, you know, this has allowed us to create greater focus on gender goals. It's allowed greater allocation of resources towards gender specific activities. It's increased the level and quality of analysis that's been done on gender. And it's actually changed rules and regulations that impact on gender too. So this is not, um, you know, theoretical stuff. You know, countries have told us this and they've demonstrated that this stuff is making a difference and it has and it continues to make a difference. However, we've also learned that there's very highly uneven practices across the G20. And in fact, the average level of practices in some cases is quite disappointing. Um, and there are parts of the public financial management process, particularly towards the debt, what we call the downstream end of it, you know, the budget execution side, the monitoring, the audit, the external audit and oversight, where there's still lots to be done. And in particular, we see a gap between what is sometimes legislated and what is really implemented in practice. Now, what are some of these, you know, what are some of these challenges that people, uh, the countries face? And I'm sure, you know, many of our participants will, this will hopefully chime with many of you. Um, but, you know, some of the, the, the top five things that countries reported to us. Number one, lack of clear guidance and clarity of roles from the center. Number two, coordination problems between departments particularly in, at times the, the lacking role of the Ministry of Finance, who we think really needs to play a key role in this. Number three, you know, lack of um, sufficient data disaggregation. Now, one thing we push on is actually there's an awful lot more data usually out there than people realize. It just sits in different parts of the public sector. So we always really encourage um, countries to explore, particularly administrative data where they can. Poor quality of um, um, gender impact assessments. Here we, you know, we think it's really important to broaden these tools out and, and just be very pragmatic. And lastly, insufficient, you know, political support. Ultimately, you can't get around the fact this is you know, this requires, you know, a value set right from the top of government. So um, that's what we found from the G20 paper. Our experience of working with capacity development and workshops in, you know, over 120 countries from the IMF is that there are actually many countries out there doing a great job outside of the G20, particularly countries like Rwanda, Uganda, um, Morocco, Albania. Um, and many of these are really leapfrogging the G20 countries, and this is super encouraging. So I think that's uh, you know some of the insights we found from this from this assessment we've done on G20 countries. It's really encouraging. There's still lots to be done, and it's really um, the implications I think uh, go broader than the G20 too. So uh, hopefully that was um, in time. Thanks very much. Over to you, Nico. Wow, I mean, uh, recent, very well said, and uh, I mean, what a report! I, I, I'll encourage every participants to. I mean, if possible, access those reports so that we can really know what's outstanding. Um, Kara, I'll just take it up from um, where uh, Vincent stopped. He said some very uh, important things. Um, how critical this topic of discussion is to the macroeconomic health of the country as evidenced by the research report. So, I mean, my question to you, I mean, in your view, um, what's, uh, I mean, what is your view of the gender responsiveness of fiscal policies around the world. And I mean, my qu main question is, are we making any progress in ensuring that uh, countries are more gender responsive? Over to you, Kira. Uh, thank you, Nike. And, um, and yes, a very nice to hear also from Vincent. Um, you heard that there is a lot of focus now, and I, I would like to emphasize it's not just the macro criticality, but it's also the shared prosperity and poverty reduction, and 50% uh, of the world population is composed of women. So this is an important um, part of the economic uh, agenda. It should be. So are we making progress? Yes, I think there has been some progress over the past 10 years. Um, even with the challenges of the ongoing uh, COVID pandemic and other recent crises um, that, as you know, require fiscal policy instruments to focus on number of challenges. And um, 
but let me let me quote a few. In a way, we are re-emphasizing things that uh, Hannah and also Vincent have um, said in their in their points and comments. Uh, I, I think there is greater awareness of the role of fiscal policy <clears throat> and how it can play in both uh, closing gender gaps and sometimes also exacerbating them. And so several international institutions, not only the IMF and the World Bank, of course, but also the OSD regional agencies are investing more in uh, active research program on fiscal policy and gender and work to raise awareness among country partners. Why are we focusing on a research? Is also because it does inform the technical assistance, but for the World Bank, it's also important to have strong analytical underpinnings for our operational, for our lending operations. So more tools have been developed to increase awareness of implicit and explicit biases in fiscal policy and how those can be eliminated. And as you know, the implicit one, so trying to understand why, I don't know, a certain tax, and I'll get back to it a bit uh, later, is, um, you know, it's some, a, a, a simple tax that seems no was property taxes, why would that be a bias against women? Um, it, it's often it's, it's, it requires more analytical understanding. Several countries have also taken steps to use fiscal policy to close the gender gaps. And it's still a work in progress, especially in uh, low income and emerging economies. But as, as others have mentioned, I would like to quote Indonesia, Mexico, and Morocco, but then you heard about Rwanda, Albania. They are all investing in understanding the impact of their budgetary allocation on women and men, and use data uh, that they collect in their reform efforts. So what gender budgeting has a long history, there's also been progress on the tax side. And with several countries looking at the design of the personal income and the indirect taxes, and some going beyond those to see how other types of taxes can be used to promote gender equality. And that's why I was mentioning, for example, property taxes. And so let me say what uh, some work that has been completed by World Bank teams in India are evaluating the implementation of legal measures that provide concessions for the purchase of transfer of property in women's names and discounts on recurrent property tax for women held properties. The study found that the discounts on stamp duty have encouraged female property ownership. And the impact of the stamp duty is even greater when coupled with non-tax incentives, such as a loan concession for women who are planning to buy a property in their name. Um, and uh, you will see there is a blog coming soon um, on this uh, exam, specific example. These are some progress and very interesting analytics that we're also very proud of. And, and, and the IMF is also doing fantastic work as we heard from Vincent and others, of course. But a lot of the work on gender budgeting and public finance management, in our view, especially in low-income countries, remains a process. Um, and it really does require uh, a process that needs to be supported and encouraged. And it does require um, still very a lot of commitment and that's that, that's also the reason why we keep on like today having these events so uh let me stop here and uh over to you nika thanks very much kara uh, i mean um i would i've really loved to have a follow-up question but i still will um i mean i know we're running on time but this is a, a very important discussion and uh, I would like to get the perspective of the two of you. So what has come out very strongly uh, from this uh, discussion for me is uh, the importance of coordination, collaboration, partnership to strengthen the del delivery outcomes on the part of all the stakeholders. So my question uh, would be how can um, gender fiscal uh, PFM and, and PFM, I mean, the gender professionals, fiscal professionals, PFM professionals address the remaining challenges in a coherent way to de deliver better uh, impact. I mean, in just one minute, I mean, even if it's just one word you want to say or whatever, I mean, what more can we do? 
uh, Kara, you can start and then Vincent. Okay, thank you. So um, here are a few points. Um, as I was saying, there are a few areas that could be strengthened and for greater collaboration and also greater impact. And one is a collection of sex disaggregated data that can be used in public finance system. Administrative data, granular administrative data that is sex disaggregated needs to be collected. It needs to be part of the normal statistical collection of data and released in an anonymized way for researchers and policymakers to use. So it should be part of the normal um, national statistics information. As such data is necessary in order to match expenditure to outcome. And as countries are also automating and digitalizing the public finances system, there seems to be an opportunity to ensure data collection, effective data collection. And let me add that there are also a lot of other ways to collect data. I think Vincent alluded to that and as well uh, through also many other sources that are the conventional ones like within comments, but also relying on crowdsources forms. And I can think of also now uh, there are a lot of it's very interesting experiments done by um, think tanks and non-governmental organizations using also satellite data and other sources. So the point is, what is the governance of data, how to improve it, and also how to ensure that there is that level of disaggregation. Second, I think some of the new tools can be disseminated more widely to help more widely to help strengthen countries' capacity to analyze the impact of taxes on transfers on men and women. And for example, the World Bank has developed a new approach using the commitment to equity. Um, it's called the CEQ framework for assessing who bears the burden of taxes and gets the benefits of the transfers. And the CEQ assessment facilitates policy discussions on questions such as how much income distribution and poverty reduction is being accomplished through the fiscal policy. And now equalizing and pro poor are specific taxes and government spending. While at the same time, we're also looking at the impact of taxes on disposable income and ideally also by um, then uh, by disaggregated by sex. In the interest of time, I'll cut it short, but there is a one third point that we need to pay more attention to policy implementation and not just policy or budget planning. So the execution of the budget, the, the entire chain, delivery chain of the public financial management system, as well as also our tax sides, it's important. So is the money also going to the right place? And as you know, uh, the World Bank has invested a lot. We have a system boost that collects data also at the treasury level. But again, we are not uh, we don't have the granularity on the division of uh, gender sex, sorry, uh, gender data. And uh, and that's partly because there is not culture to collect the data in such a way. So, but it will be great to have that. And finally, to bring this all together, um, and I think when I said, so your question, Nika, was also how do we work together? All the various, um, parts of a government that they look at the spending, at the revenue collection, at the fiscal uh, space, and also fiscal sustainability, they all have to have access to this information and to be able to interact together and make it a point of policy. The policy, um, it has to be a policy decision to be able to follow also impact on uh, gender impact of policies. And uh, I leave it here. <laughs> Thanks, Kiera. I mean, this is a very passionate topic for many one, and I know for you. So I know we can spend a long time discussing this. Uh, Vincent, your your quick um, perspective uh, in one minute, please. Absolutely, super quick. So um, I think it, Kiara's excellent point allows me to be slightly more esoteric, and I might say that you know my advice would be do take whatever opportunity you can to improve the gender budgeting system. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, you know, there are many, many roads to Nirvana. Our experience that there's no single way to do gender budgeting. At its core, ask, you know, what are you trying to get done out of this thing? You know, to what extent can you improve policy design? To what extent can you improve allocations towards gender responsive programming? And what's the quickest, most efficient way to get there? 
don't get hung up on trying to perfect perfect the system or trying to do gender budgeting for the sake of doing gender budgeting ask yourself what's the result you're trying to get to and what's the minimum you need to get there um you know we colloquially in the fund talk about countries that are trying to build the ferrari of gender budgeting and we think don't if you don't have the underlying pfm capacity to do it don't try try with a start with a fiat i'm just trying to say with an italy here you know so i don't offend the country but you know try to um uh, um to be super pragmatic about it brutally pragmatic and be patient recognize this is a non-linear process south africa started this in 1995 they're still tweaking and perfecting it australia was an early progenitor they've waxed and waned over the past decade due to politics austria took you know seven years to get this done so be patient, be pragmatic, take whatever opportunity you can and learn from others, exactly as Chiara said. You know, this is, you're not the first ones to try this. Um, there's a wealth of international experience out there. There's a wealth of officials out there in other countries that are dying to tell you, hey, don't do that. We tried that. That was really painful. So, you know, come learn from us. Um, the IMF does a lot of capacity development in this area and we help to set countries' roadmaps for how they can progress and, and tailor to the level of ambition. So please reach out to us too, as well as many of the other wonderful um, colleagues here. Thanks very much. Over to you, Nico. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Vincent. Thanks, Kiara. Very strong points coming out um, for every country, for every partner. Gender responsiveness is very important in the macro and fiscal dialogue. It's, a very, it's very important in the discussion on shared prosperity. It's very important in the in, in discussion on the economy. And this is just one strong way we can move the countries forward. Somebody said some countries are willing but there is no capacity. You had Vincent, reach out to us, reach out to development partners. The PFAS Secretariat uh, has the gender, uh, I mean, what we call the PIFA gender that you can use to do a self-assessment to know where you are and what policies you need to do. Please don't keep quiet. This is the work we all need to do. So very sincere thanks, Kara and Vincent. That was really powerful. So at this point, I would like to go to the PIFA Secretariat. Um, they've been doing some work. They've been engaging with many people, trying to understand the feel, the pulse of everyone on this important topic. So Tia and Ellen, over to you. Let's hear what the world is saying. Thank you, Nike, and thank you, everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Tia Rapona from the BIFA Secretariat. Fascinating discussion. And if you see the chat, I cannot keep up. There's so many questions and comments in there. So it shows it's such an important topic. So what we're going to do actually is have a quick poll. Um, Sandra is going to put a quick poll with three questions on your screens. So you audience, as well as the panelists, if you want, please have a look at the questions and let us know what you think about the topics as we just discussed. Um, you should see the, the poll on your screen right now. Take a few moments to look at the questions and pick one answer what you think is the most um, important for you um, and most relevant answer for you. So the first question is, what do you think is the most important benefit of a gender uh, a responsive BFM or gender budgeting, as we all call it? The second question is, what do you think is the most important bottleneck in gender um, uh, responsive BFM? And the final question is, is why is there a need for tools like Beef Agenda? I'll introduce Beef Agenda you to shortly, but of course, Beef Agenda is a BFM diagnostic tool that, as Nikia just said, helps to assess whether BFM system integrate gender uh, or not. So please have a look. I'll, I'll leave it for a few more seconds, and then uh, we can have a quick look at what the results are and what you think about these topics. We have quite a few people already answering. I'll give it a few more minutes because there's simply, the numbers seem to be increasing. Um, so you also have a, have a say. But as most of you have already done, please also use the chat to ask questions, give comments, because we will have uh, time at the end of the session to also um, look at the um, audience questions and comments so that you have a, also a chance to participate. Oh, fantastic. I think we are coming closer to 80 people answering now. So we will probably close the poll now. Sandra, if you don't mind ending the poll. There you are. And now we see the results. Uh, thank you so much for answering. In terms of what do you think is the most important benefit of gender VFM? Not surprisingly, um, the answers are divided, all the uh, options that we provided to you, because all these are important. 
As we have just discussed today, it is a way to allocate uh, resources and spend resources to support gender equality. But it is also an important way to promote that understanding that many of us talked about today of who our budget policies actually support, uh, benefit and who not. But it is also absolutely critical part of effective PFM systems overall. In terms of bottlenecks, interestingly, I think the top uh, obstacle that you ad identified is perhaps lack of a weak political direction and gender priorities set out. And of course, that, that's where it all starts from, and that's absolutely critical. BFM system, of course, is only way to implement those gender priorities and that political direction. But all the other um, issues are also, of course, important. Uh, coordination between Ministry of Finance and line ministries, technical skills and resources, as well as also societal norms and sex disagreed data um, also at the end. And then finally, why, why is there a need for tools like for Gender? This was always a bit of cheek and tongue. We wanted to find out from you whether you think our tool is useful for you. The most important thing that you thought is the PIFA tool is a way to guide technical implementation of gender BFM, as well as creating that benchmark for progress for countries, where they are and where they can go. That's really, really helpful. Thank you so much. We, If we stop sharing um, the poll right now, and um, basically I will now um, share my screen and introduce Beef Agenda tool to you briefly, and also particularly look at how Beef Agenda can be a way to address some of the uh, problems and issues that many of the panelists and speakers have identified already today. As I said, Beef Agenda is a BFM diagnostic tool. It is a way to assess the BFM systems, which aspects of that integrate gender and which aspects they don't. It is a public tool, um, public good, everybody can use it. Um, but it is also a way to um, look at your BFM systems overall together with the core national PIFA framework that we have. What is important for us um, in PIFA agenda as well as the PIFA core uh, assessment framework is that we think it's very important to look at BFM instruments and BFM processes and systems across the budget cycle. And why do we think that's important? It is because of the issues Vincent talked about earlier. Although we know that there are challenges in integrating gender in the BFM systems across the budget cycle, perhaps the, the most important and challenging issues tend to be at the end of the budget cycle. For example, even if there might be some consideration of gender in fiscal policies or budget plans or budget circulars, what we find is that in, in many cases, when it comes to actually tracking how is that um, our money spent, what are the real impacts for women, these aspects tend to be much weaker. And as Vincent said, particularly extra, external scrutiny side, the role of um, our supreme audit institutions and parliament in really holding governments accountable for implementing these policies tend to be much weaker. So, how can beef agenda help then? Of course, because it's a BFM diagnostic tool, it is a way to give countries an idea where they are on gender BFM and where they can improve. It is also a way to track progress over time and see how you're making progress. But one important point to note to point is that although gender budgeting or gender responsive BFM has been around for a while, there hasn't been that international consensus of what good gender BFM really looks like. A beef agenda, and this is what our stakeholders tell us, is an excellent way, as Arturo said earlier, BIFA is a credible tool within the finance ministries. And when we have beef agenda, it's a credible, objective way to bring partners together around agreed, globally agreed indicators to discuss what gender BFM means. Of course, uh, good gender BFM systems look different in different countries, but it's a way of benchmarking yourself and asking questions of what could this gender BFM look for in our country. 
The second point is really about then um, increasing capacity and knowledge. And what I mean by that is we know that um, gender BFM skills, instruments, are still weak and they still need to increase capacity. We've heard in some developing countries, you know, it is also a capacity issue. And many countries, even developed countries, still struggle with some of these instruments. What our stakeholders tell the FIFA agenda is also a way for them to think about what do those uh, technical uh, instruments and processes look like. But again, this looks in very different, different contexts. For example, Indonesia had done a gender BFM for a long time when they did their PIVA gender assessment. But it was a way for them to think about how you actually start integrating the collection of sex discredited data and developing those skills and processes throughout the government, not only in the central ministries of Indonesia to make sure that it's actually implemented effectively. But the other example is Fiji. There's a picture of Fiji and an oyster farm in there. Fiji had started the gender BFM really uh, relatively recently with, when they did their beef agenda assessment. And beef agenda gave them really good ideas how to think about those issues that many of the speakers already talked about. How do you actually start looking at your budget policies and really understanding what the, what the impacts are for women, whether they're negative, whether they're positive, and whether they're intended or unintended. For example, the, the Ministry of Economy officials told us how through after the, doing the PIF agenda assessment, they were looking at the oyster farming programs and they realized that they very unintentionally disencouraged people of women attending those training courses. And that gave an impetus to really think about how they changed the design of that policy to make sure it also um, impact, impacts and benefits women. And then finally, it is a way to bring partners together around the table to have a discussion. We've heard already how important it is that, is that, is that there, there's political direction and support, but that you have different partners, whether it's Ministry of Finance, Aligned Ministries, development partners, but also experts like us, BFM experts, gender experts, fiscal policy experts, together to think about what are the gender equality policies in countries and what the good gender BFM systems look like in that context and in that country. And BFA assess gender assessments are a way to bring those partners together to have those conversations. I will now move on to my colleague, Helen, who will tell you a little about where have we used BFA gender so far. Over to you, Helen. Thanks, Tia and Dear Hall. It's a pleasure to share with you the map of the BFA assessments and to discuss, and I'm very happy to see all the partners here and all the participants. So as you can see on the map, um, we, are not, we have now 33 gender assessments implemented or at the draft stage. And I will share with you the key takeaways at the same time, quantitatively and qualitatively. So to begin with, from a quantitative perspective, uh, the framework was piloted at the beginning by in eight countries in 2019, and the methodology was published in January 2020. And I like to uh, uh, emphasize the expertise of governments, the engagement of PIFA partners, such as the World Bank, EU, who is here to, which is here today, NORAD, the IMF, and these eight pilots were conducted in different countries. Uh, chosen to be representative of different situations. And where are we now at the end, uh, at big, the mid-2022? So the pipeline of assessments has grown gradually. You can see on the slide three colors. First, we have the dark blue spots showing that 16 assessments are finalized, so included the eight pilots, Tia talked about Fiji, Indonesia, and 11 of these assessments are published on the website. So I really encourage you to go to the PIFA website and to look into these published public documents. What is interesting also is that we have seven national assessments, but also 
for subnational assessments, which means that gender is also looked at a local level. Then we have the sky blue spots, we call them uh, draft reports, illustrated that by the five uh, assessments that are in draft stage, for example, Aranda, Nauru, uh, Antigua and Barbuda, St. Lucia, Haiti. And finally, the planned report. As all of you told us today, we really have a high demand on these assessments because PIFA tool is a wide uh, spread tool. So we have 12 planned assessments that are ongoing. What it means for us, a planned assessment, means that we have a concept note and that we support the countries. So you, what we can say is that we can see that all the regions are represented. Many PIFA partners participate in the fundings. So we have, for example, UN Women. We are working very well with UN Women, USAID, Canadian Aid, the AFD. It's also interesting to note that, as I said, some assessments are undertaken at the subnational level. I think of Cameroon, of Ukraine, and also in high-income countries, such as Norway or Belgium. So you can really see, and it's it's a pleasure to share this with us, with you, and with all of us that we represent today uh, what we have in the P5 assessment because. Participants are from all over the world. From a more qualitative perspective, and it wraps up many of the elements that were highlighted by our panelists and throughout all the presentations. For the PIFA, from the PIFA Secretariat point of view, there are four success factors to uh, a PIFA assessment. The first one is that the Ministry of Finance as the agency responsible for public finance as a key role to play. And it was said by different panelists, but we want to highlight that because it means that gender equality is taken into account in all aspects of the budget cycle and that gender responsive PFM efforts are pursued. Second, and it was also said, and we like to highlight it also, the gender disaggregated data and the information are really key and help policymakers to assess and develop gender based uh, policies. Third, and that's what the uh, PIFA uh, has told us, the PIFA reports have told us in most of the situation, it's needed to integrate gender responsive budgeting in the legal framework because it, it needs to be systematic and sustainable. And finally, the fourth point would be that uh, really the PIFA framework shows that it's really essential to integrate gender consideration throughout the budget cycle. And it ensures that poly all the policies are developed from a gender perspective. So many thanks, and for the last slide, please. We uh, send you, please, next slide. Yeah, just to, to learn more on our PIFA uh, assessments and our PIFA framework, please uh, go to pifa.org gender. We have a, a web page, and also all the public reports uh, are available, so you can uh, look at all the results from the PIFA Secretariat. Many thanks all. Over to you, Nikkei. Thanks very much, Atia and Helen, um, for that very informative session. Um, we're, we're running behind time, um, but of course, because of the very interesting discussion we are having, we'll definitely see how to make sure we end right on time. So at this point, uh, I mean, we've had from um, some, uh, I mean, we, we've had from the bank, we've had from IMF, we've had um, from the leadership. What I would like us to do is now hear from the countries. Let's get the country perspectives on what, what they're doing in their countries. And I have two people here with me today. Um, Grace Untereka, uh, PFM Reform Coordinator in the Ministry of Finance of Botswana, and Osula, uh, 
Rosenbichler. You know, I try all names. I hope I'm not uh, calling the name wrongly. My apologies. Uh, head of Department, Federal Minister of Arts, Culture, Civil Service and Sports, which I believe also includes gender in Austria. Uh, so let me start with Grace to uh, so give us a very quick uh, case of Botswana and the recent self-assessment using PIFA gender. Grace, I will appreciate if we can do this in five minutes, just a very brief uh, overview, and then uh, uh, Ursula too in five minutes. Grace, over to you. <laughs> Okay, good afternoon. I will try to do the five minutes. Uh, Botswana conducted the PIFA assessment in 20, is it 2022. The report was published in April. That is, means it's two and a half months old. And it was a self-assessment. And uh, the lesson learned is uh, the public finance management system is very key in promoting uh, public policies. And also it was a litmus test for our PFM system to really establish if we are really addressing gender equality. Even though our national development plan has an objective of promoting uh, gender equality, we find from the assessment that the attention or the thinking is not really being done during planning to fulfill that objective. And during the assessment, we also uh, find that uh, the planning of the budget ex and budget execution, they lack in terms of sex desegregated data. And it was a good feedback for us because we are currently doing public finance management reforms and we are at the end of our 11th uh, national development plan. We'll be developing a 12th national development plan which means this feedback from this assessment can be adequately used as an input for developing the next national development plan. And as we have the feedback that having the objective in the plan doesn't uh, uh, show that we are achieving results, it means more content can be applied in terms of uh, operationalizing objectives that we normally design. Also having a good PFM uh, policies or act uh, does not deliver gender equality, except when the reporting is targeted in promoting service equality. And we can talk about service equality, but when we cannot track it, we will not be able to establish the impact of the financial resources in this uh, in the larger population and be able to address the gaps that are existing in gender equality so the assessment also learn lesson is uh, what development partners are doing because we realized during the assessment that we have not paid much attention to the results or the report produced by development partners but during the assessment we realized that they are doing a lot of work in terms of matching the PFM or directly the financial resources allocated to the results on the ground. They evaluate the impact and we are able to appreciate and uh, I think there's a good feedback that we realized during the assessment. Over and above that also budget impact is not only about what is being allocated and what we have spent. It's not an expenditure driven. You have to really look into the impact. And in absence of sex desegregated data, you are not able to establish the impact on individual or on the standard of living or equitable service delivery. So this assessment was a real good feedback for the country in terms of policy design, in terms of evaluating our performance as a whole government. And also it feed, is feeding directly uh, into our PFM reform program, public sector reforms that are happening throughout government. So we'll be able to track our performance and also efficiently manage the fiscal spaces. Because when you have the feedback in terms of the impact, being able to track impact down to the ground, you can be able to prioritize projects. You can be able to prioritize spending or financing of any activity. But in absence of sex desegregated data, you might find that you are, may, maybe you are creating more gaps 
Uh, for instance, if I give an example, we have initiatives to promote uh, marginalized groups in procurement uh, programs. And uh, it's targeting women, youth, and people living with disability. And uh, youth and people living with disability are not, decided, are not apportioned to establish how much of females we are targeting or males. And in absence of that, we might find that at the end, when the program is evaluated, the gap is worse than when we, we started. And overall, these uh, results are going to really help us to design the strategies or frameworks, how we can integrate gender into the budgeting cycle. And also it will be, uh, it was going to guide us, how can we uh, start, because it's a situational analysis to us. It has reflected what is the current status. Whatever we develop in gender, we'll be able to uh, design having in mind what is the actual situation on the ground. Also, we have learned that it, some of the things don't need money to implement. Uh, for instance, uh, we have issued a next financial year budget, uh, budget guidelines. This year, for the first time in the history of the country, it included uh, the gender data for the, for the land ministries to express how or to give feedback the progress on the objective of promoting a gender equality in our national development plan and how are they progressing with the SDG 5. And this is coming up uh, following the results that we have. And we have realized that there are other things, milestones that we can start implementing because at this juncture we are still sharing the report with the stakeholders which we think uh, at the end, we are going to be able to develop a good strategy for the country on how we can uh, develop a gender responsive budgeting. And uh, because we have already interacted with a lot of stakeholders, there's a high interest and everybody's really willing to come forth and participate. And we believe this is not going to be a one is not going to be one-sided. The government is, has open doors for the development partners, uh, civil society organizations, because we have shared the result with them, mm -hmm. which we think before the end of this financial year, we will be having a roadmap on really how to improve the current status. Thank so you. All, all in close, I will just say, it also helped in capacity building because it was a self-assessment done by government officials. Mm -hmm. And uh, the benefit is that when we implement these findings, we will have people across all sectors of government as we pull people from various sectors. So implementation is going to be not easier, but at least we have, we'll have a wide range of participants. And the buy-in also is very impressive as we are sharing the this result with the uh, different uh, stakeholders. So I would say overall, this uh, tool is very good and is giving feedback to countries where we can really reflect our status and plan accordingly because it's a situational analysis in short. Thanks. Uh, um, thank, you. Great. Th thank you very much. It's, it's so nice to get the perspectives from Botswana. And uh, I mean, I really liked it when you said it's not all about money. So, um, I mean, quite a lot of lessons to learn. So let me go to uh, Ursula. Um, let's hear the Austrian experience of, uh, uh, I mean, gender responsive PFM and the lessons learned. Also in five minutes, if you can, please. I think you're still on. Yes. Yes. You can hear me now. Thank you. Thank you for this invitation. And thank you that I have the possibility to share some thoughts with you. Uh, first of all, nothing is about, uh, not all is about budget. Uh, I'm not positioned in the Ministry of Finance. I'm not part of the Ministry of Finance and I'm not part of the Ministry of Women Affairs. So I'm located in the Ministry of Public Administration. I'm the head of department for strategic performance management and public sector innovation. And what we are doing is we um, develop the technical instruments to steer a country, to steer uh, the nation, to uh, monitor 
the, um, uh, the, uh, the success of a country uh, with its policy. And so maybe uh, what I am talking now about is very abstract because it's the implementation of the technical instrument we have in Austria and what I'm responsible for. And I want to give only short answers to the three questions you have asked um, before this um, meeting and you have sent to me. Uh, what have we achieved till now? Between uh, 2009 and 2013, a budget reform was initiated in Austria and executed. And it was my department um, uh, which was responsible for the implementation of this budget reform um, with the Ministry of Finance. And our focus was the introduction of uh, outcome orientation and um, to introduce impact orientation at all in the Austrian system. And we have two instruments in Austria um, to do this. It's the performance management system and the um, uh, regulatory impact assessment. And both instruments within this performance management in Austria have a gender focus. Um, the performance management system requires ministry to define outcome objectives, measures and indicators, which are part of the budget and the success of achieving the outcome objectives is reported yearly to the parliament. Uh, as part of this performance management system, the outcome objectives are specified for each gender uh, budget chapter, and each budget chapter must include at least one objective related to gender equality. And in turn, each of the global budgets within the budget chapter and the detailed budget must include at least also one gender related output target. In this way, each line ministry is obliged to consider how its activities relate to gender equality and to design objectives and indicators to promote gender equality in the context of the budget in the own ministry. Reporting on the gender related objectives is covered in the performance reports prepared in our ministry and they are reported each year to the parliament. The second instrument, the regulatory impact assessment applies to new laws, regulations and bigger projects. And as a result of the regulatory impact assessment, they, uh, those are discussed on basis of their desired outcomes and outputs and their success will be measurable also by the use of indicators. Um, gender equality is now one of the dimension of analysis that must routinely be included in the impact assessment, ex ante and ex post. We also have yearly a report um, to this um, regulatory impact assessments to the parliament. So taken as a whole, uh, the Austrian system of policymaking is designed to require all ministries to consider gender equality, both in their high level goal setting and in more detailed specification of outputs and objectives. It's designed to assess impacts on gender equality in the design of policies using a standardized assessment template and applied assessment both, ex ante and ex post, I said it already, and is designed to account for the achievements in gender equality goals and objectives via the annual performance reports. So this is the theory. Uh, now I will come to the implementation and now it's, it's more complex. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it was also very hard work to, uh, to build up this design and um, to, um, to have it um, as a law in Austria. It's, uh, it's the budget act which uh, is responsible for the, um, uh, for the um, uh, implementation. But since uh, 2011, we have this implementation process and I think we have it finished now on, the on a technical level. Uh, what have we done? We have a new budget structure, we have a new accounting system, we have performance management, including gender budgeting and result-oriented management at administrative units. Um, the reform changed the system of public administration in a sense that controlling and reporting tools were established and clear responsibilities were defined. And we used um, a lot of digital tools to implement this system and to make the instruments work. Uh, this transformation led to a huge change process involving over 130,000 employees. 
know-how had to be distributed and the activities of employees had to be adapted to the new controlling system. <coughs> and this controlling system is based on the usual um, plan to check act um, circle. And furthermore, leaders in the public administration and employees had to be integrated in the exchange process in order to enable this cultural transformation. So um, what are the lessons learned? Uh, the lessons learned is if you um, have the feeling it's the end of implementation, it begins from, from uh, you have to begin, um, or you have to start again. <laughs> I could see clearly because it's a, it's a never ending journey. Um, we have a, a very high level of um, implementation on the digital level and technical level and on the level of, of, of trainings. Uh, due to the system, um, but the statement um, is representing uh, the, the ministry. So what we have to do now is to put more work on information um, about how the federal government as a whole is advancing the agenda of gender equality. Um, what we have um, to, uh, to, to focus is that from theory, from concept, from law to practice, um, there are several success factors we have to um, we have to challenge. For example, be aware of the change, the cultural change. Ensure the quality of the new processes and structures. Train the skills. Be supportive. Integrate the new system into existing instruments. Implement project management tools, and be sure of the political will. For example, if there is there are crises like now. Um, they, um, um, uh, it, it, it's uh, sometimes they forget we have this very beautiful system of, of performance management because um, crisis is always the first which um, has to be tackled. Um, yes. Uh, thanks, Sula. I, I would like to stop you there. I mean, I haven't yeah. have worked with Austria. I, I mean, I really um, appreciate what you are saying, and I really see how this is uh, being implemented in government and in many parts that uh, we've had the opportunity to work with. So thanks for sharing those consensual efforts to make sure that um, gender re responsiveness is uh, you know, ingrained in all parts of the work. So um, at this point, I would like to go to Erica. Erica is head of unit macroeconomic analysis and uh, fiscal policies and budget support in the European Commission. Um, Erica, what is the way forward? We've had um, from the bank, we've had from IMF, the FIFA secretariat has given us their perspectives. Uh, we've had from the countries themselves. But what is the way forward? How do we address the gender gaps through public finance? Uh, we'd like to hear your perspective. Sorry, sorry I'll cut short your time. Um, <laughs> but i uh, really like to know your perspectives, Erica. Over to you. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Nikkei. And uh, um, good morning, good good afternoon, good evening to, to, to all of you. Uh, bonjour. Uh, bonjour à tous. Um, really very happy to have the opportunity to, uh, to, to, uh, to attend this discussion, which I find really uh, fascinating, as well as the very active discussion in the, in the chat box. I'm, I'm very honored to also come and speak after uh, my Austrian colleague and, and indeed building on the strong uh, uh, Austria, uh, Austrian experience in terms of gender uh, budgeting in Austria and at subnational level. Um, from the European Commission's viewpoint uh, and working on international partnerships, so that is uh, really uh, the external uh, aid that we are providing to, to partner countries outside uh, the EU. Obviously, gender uh, and gender equality is not a new uh, is not a new topic, but we have uh, given it a new impetus uh, with the current financial framework, which just uh, uh, started uh, last year, uh, with what we call the Gender Action Plan Three. And uh, the, the, this, this is for us a very uh, important policy paper that uh, stretches and sketches uh, how we as, as EU mainstream uh, gender equality in, in all our programs uh, around the world. And through this, we actually gave a very important target whereby 85% of all the actions we are working on outside the EU should have an impact on uh, gender equality. 
Uh, so this 85% target is, is a very high and ambitious target, and it reflects a very strong political uh, commitment from the European Commission and from our Commissioner Jutta Orpilainen and President Ursula von der Leyen uh, to gender equality within the EU, uh, but also in our action uh, outside, the, um, outside the EU. This is, this is based on a human rights uh, based approach. Uh, we also promote a gender transformative approach where we are trying to engage with all possible actors to change norms. We have talked about this uh, during this uh, session and stereotypes that hamper uh, this uh, progress in, in that field. What is really relatively new to our approach now, and uh, it's that we are increasingly and hopefully one day systematically looking at the gender from the public finance management lens, because indeed it's not all about money, but at the end of the day, a policy without money cannot really be implemented. Um, so we we would like to to really go much deeper into this um, uh, gender dimension of the of the budget, uh, for, on on all the dimensions of the cycle, and I really appreciate the presentation that was made by the PFAS Secretariat on this uh, gender uh, module and this, this, uh, uh, this tool that really assesses the gender dimension all across the, the budget uh, cycle up to implementation and monitoring of the implementation. Um, so to, to engage in this uh, with partner countries on gender responsive budgeting, we think that having a good baseline and understand what already exists uh, is indeed essential. We talked about data and, and, and I believe indeed that the quality of data is important and uh, more generally, I think that a bigger effort needs to be done uh, on quality of data and disaggregated uh, gender based data, disaggregated data. Uh, in, in, our, in our cooperation. I, I know the World Bank is also uh, increasing its uh, effort in the, um, in, in the actions towards uh, low-income countries in this, uh, in this respect. So starting from this sort of commitment to on, on gender and, and looking more at, the, at the, the, the public finance side of things, we are as commission very much committed uh, and, and, and I'm really proud that we have supported the, the, the setup uh, and the design of this uh, PIFA gender uh, module. And uh, we are very much uh, in encouraging uh, to include this uh, PIFA module in all the PIFA assessments uh, that we are financing around the world. Uh, it's just as an, a set of nine indicators, uh, but with this set, we can measure the degree to which the country's PFM systems address the government's uh, goals with regard, regard to, to gender uh, equality. And, and the framework can apply both at national level and sub-national level. So really depending on the level of maturity, political engagements, it's, it's also possible to start at sub-national level maybe before going at, uh, at national uh, level. So it's a perfect start, starting point to introduce this uh, gender dimension in PFM reform strategies and action plans. And uh, well, we saw the map of, um, uh, of all the gender modules that have been uh, and gender assessments that have been, been already rolled out. Uh, and that we are uh, proudly, uh, we have contributed to 21 of these uh, assessments. So we are very proud to, 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 to take part in this, um, in this action because it also um, then provides the, the, the action plans that will allow us uh, to roll out the technical assistance and capacity building work with the different institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, um, uh, and other EU member states' uh, expertise uh, as well. At the same time, and this is maybe more on from an EU perspective, uh, as much as we can and whenever the conditions are met, we are providing our aid through budget support, so direct budget support, so really feeding the national budgets with our, um, with our con grant contribution. And in this context, we are also more and more uh, promoting gender equality through the policy dialogue, through the use of the specific um, uh, performance uh, indicators uh, uh, on the basis, again, of disaggregated uh, data through technical assistance uh, and, and work with the sectoral ministries and the finance ministers. And it is indeed for me a really important point to, to manage to put the sector ministries and the ministers of finance at the same table. The colleague from the IMF was saying that it, the, the IMF has demonstrated the macro criticality of, uh, of gender equality. And this is really the type of arguments that are necessary to bring the ministers of finance at the table to say this is not a long term challenge. This is not something for the medium long term that we can think of an as an afterthought. No, it's an immediate 
short-term concern, gender equality is good for the economy and, and therefore should be financed um, from, from the budget. Uh, another dimension uh, which is uh, um, more and more coming up on the agenda is that with the huge needs for, for investments around the world and, and as EU we, we, have, we are promoting the, the global gateway strategy for promoting investments in the digital green uh, agenda, uh, fighting uh, climate change um, uh, consequences, but also promoting uh, sound health and education systems uh, for the future, genera future generations. All this generates a, a huge amount of investments or should generate a huge amount of investments, public investments, and hence uh, put a lot of uh, li uh, light on the public procurement systems. Uh, on this, we are also working with the, the, the World Bank as well as the OECD on the MAPS uh, assessment tool, which also in itself developed guidance on how to consider uh, gender um, in the procurement uh, systems. And, and so, so just uh, thought it would be interesting uh, to, uh, to, to give uh, this, this um, extra uh, information uh, to you. Final point maybe on, on domestic revenue mobilization, which has also been mentioned by some of the speakers. Working, I mean, working on public finance and the execution execution of the budget or the, the, the expenditure side of the budget is, is, is essential. But working on the tax dimension is also uh, very important. Uh, we are working here again uh, with the IMF on the TADAT um, uh, assessment tool, uh, where uh, we feel that it would be um, uh, important to, to, to work on this, uh, on the measures of the gender impact. And here, I, I also would like to highlight that we are working with civil society actors uh, in particular in Uganda and Zambia, we have a very good civil society actors working on this tax dimension uh, uh, or gender dimension of tax uh, systems and doing really ground uh, work and research on this topic, which can be a very interesting source of uh, inspiration for, for many countries uh, around, uh, around the call. So just to, to conclude, uh, Nikkei, I hope I haven't, I haven't been too long, but uh, gender equality uh, indeed is not a new topic. Uh, but I believe that uh, in the situation in the context where we are now and knowing how much uh, women have been suffering from the COVID uh, crisis, have been taken out of the labor market and have been taken out of their capacity to, to be part of the um, uh, uh, um, society's uh, activities, I believe it's really important that we put this uh, agenda really uh, in the front, on the front of our agenda. And I really would like to thank you immensely for organizing this event. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Erika. And uh, of course, as usual, we'll continue to engage with the European Commission on so many important agenda. Of course, we're working on the map together. Um, also to inform you that we also looking at the gender pers perspectives of domestic resource mobilization and also on digital governance. So uh, very important points, uh, points you've uh, brought up. Thank you very much. Colleagues, when we're having this kind of very, very interesting and important discussions, it's always hard to make it within the, the one and a half time frame. So what I'm going to do is ask three, um, some panelists three quick questions. I, please just answer it in one minute or so, um, so that uh, we respond to some of the Q&As. I know some panelists have been responding to some of the questions as well. So thanks very much for that. Srini, I'd like to come to you. You are the head of the PIFA Secretariat. Is gender responsive budgeting just about changing the chart of account? Thanks, Nikki. Uh, definitely not. Gender responsive budgeting is about getting the right information for right decisions. If chart of accounts is a mechanism, there could be adjustments to chart of account which can facilitate that. But the concept is much more broader and the focus as PIFA framework, PIFA gender framework does is not on one specific solution, but the impact of it. Are we getting the right information for right decisions? Nikkei. Thanks, and thanks for keeping it to less than one minute. I really love that. Vincent, um, so um, impact of public debt on fiscal space for gender responsive budgeting. That's another question coming up. What do we do? Exactly. Now is even more important to be doing gender responsive budgeting because when there's limited fiscal space and you need to make hard spending decisions, it's even more important to understand the impact of those decisions, gender impact assessments with the right data to inform the right decisions is exactly the way to do it. Thanks very much. It's speed dating time. Thank you very much. So now I want to give the last, last um, 
So uh, the last thoughts from Hannah and Aturo. And my question is the political will. This requires political will. We saw it in the um, in the poll. We've had some comments on, on the KRA. The political will and getting all the related ministries to work together. What do we do? Hannah Benaturo. I think political will is not something esoteric. I think political will needs data and evidence to understand well what is the what the problem is and evidence on what the solution is and how to implement the solution and then to have the mechanism of course to to incorporate the, the build on the data and build on the evidence and reflect it in policy decisions and in implementation uh, through the public finance management system so in my view we are doing the right thing together generating data, working with countries that they have access to data, they have access to evidence, using it to make the case to politicians and supporting them building to build the systems and develop the policies towards solutions. Thanks, Anna. Hatsuru? Yeah, thank you, Nikke. I, I couldn't agree more with Hannah, but I, but I also recognize that sometimes politicians tend to look at the data in a slightly different way than people in the academia or at the, yeah, at the international financial institutions. So I think that giving them something that they could graph and then which they could act is, is probably very useful. I was looking at the, at the, at the web page of Hannah's, uh, Hannah's uh, group. And, and let me give you one example. They, they say, uh, as a result of COVID, uh, uh, in Kenya, they found that 16% of vulnerable adolescent girls compared to 8% of adolescent boys leave the school after COVID. That are the kind of number, that's the kind of information that resonates with politicians. So we have to tailor the information they, they get so that it actually hits a chord with them. Thank you. Well, thanks, Arturo. I, I love the speed dating, and I think we should do that more. Um, colleagues, friends, um, participants, um, you've had it. Um, you've had from experts, you've had from professionals, you've had country experiences, you've had the uh, PIFA secretariat give you uh, what we're doing. We also had from you, from the poll. Um, we've had um, some very good materials shared on the chats and we've had from you as well. So we have enough to move ahead in making sure we have a gender responsive budgeting, a gender responsive governance, if I can call it that, in everything we do. Um, again, just to very clearly say, this is not just about forgetting the discussion after today. It has to be part of our macro and fiscal dialogue in everything we do in government. Um, in other, I mean, the bank is focused on reducing a poverty on a shared prosperity. And in order to do this, gender is a core part of it. We know the statistics of the female in the entire world. This needs to be taken care of. To progress on the economy, gender needs to be uh, considered in all perspectives on it. And very importantly, coordination, collaboration, relationship, working together with all stakeholders, with all partners, is very pertinent. Wow, it's been a very great day. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Anna and Arturo for the leadership. Um, we hope we can continue to move ahead with this. Working on PFM, working on gender to support countries. Uh, very sincere thanks to Vincent and um, Chiara for giving us perspectives. Uh, and of course to Erica for giving us perspectives from the IMF from the World Bank and uh, from the European Commission. And thanks to Grace and uh, Ursula for the, uh, the Botswana and uh, Austria perspectives. Of course, sincere thanks to colleagues in the PFA Secretariat. I know you're doing a great work. We're working on this together. Keep doing the very good work and let's keep collaborating. And of course, to all the participants, uh, we hope um, you've picked something important to take back to your countries and act on. So thanks colleagues, um, apologies, three minutes behind schedule, but I'm very sure we've had a very good results doing this together. Do have a great day and remember, accelerate uh, <laughs> with gender, accelerate, I mean, equality for everybody. Keep moving hard, keep working hard. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.
Thanks, Nikkei. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Merci à tous.